Uh, I did one with Jeff Inman uh, oh, this yeah? morning, yeah, cool. which was wicked. I thought about, uh, I started getting into the podcast uh, competing so much, I was like, I'm, I feel like I'm pretty well positioned to talk to people about this stuff. I've probably competed over a hundred times um, and been to that at least that many events um, and for, you know, and then helped with a number as well. Anyway, uh, Jeff would be a good guy to interview. He's doing some cool shit. Yeah, yeah. Jeff was awesome to interview, and uh, I, I just because of the the area rescue mm. challenge that he came to in that presentation, that really um, made him like probably the person I wanted to speak to the most, just to like question him and quiz him on mm-hmm. climbing on two ropes, and yeah. like I, I'm fascinated by that because I know. I've tried it, and for somebody to be doing that um, on a, uh, you know, out at work in a production Somehow he's, he's, is he's out to try to amazing. figure out if he can be monetarily efficient, time efficient, yeah. using two ropes for yeah, trees. Yeah. People have done it. I was, who wasn't using two Blake stitches back in the day when we needed to, you know, to yeah. isolate your movement and get in position for a cut? Yeah. Like, the and with, like, with, the, with, the, with the evolution of of the equipment that we use, it's kind of it is made, it's made it easier. Oh yeah, uh, especially because you know, like Jeff said, uh, it would be so hard to do it on like two moving rope mm-hmm. systems. So and the protect fact that, branches. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thanks for for joining me. Are we doing this? We're doing this. All right. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> uh, really appreciate you kind of giving up some time. So um, yeah, I just are uh, we filming too? Uh, we're filming too. Oh nice. Yeah. Nice. All right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, d- just ignore that. Cool, cool. Um, so I want to hear a bit about Chris Coates. Um, kind of who you are, how you kind of got into the industry, and then a bit about the North American Open Masters that you cool. competition that you started. I'd, I'd yeah. love to talk about that. Yeah. So you, yeah, you go. Dude, and first of all, honestly, thank you for having me on this podcast with you and uh, it's a, this is an exciting time. I feel special honored to be on the podcast with you, uh, Mr. Holiday. All right, so my name is Chris. I, I got into arboriculture right around 17 and a half, 18 years old, pretty close to my birthday. Um, but I, I dropped out of school probably about uh, 16 years old, and I uh, started working at a concrete recycling plant and then went into a uh, myriad of other jobs like uh dishwashing. I was a prep cook at a restaurant for a while and I did roofing. And then when I was about 17, 18, I got into, uh, got into arboriculture and just stuck with it ever since. I uh, worked for Bartlett for years. I uh, put in about five years with them and uh, about three years with another small company in Maryland and then started my own business, um, Advanced Arboriculture, a small little mom and pop tree company, honestly. It's, we're small potatoes and I like it that way. Yeah, yeah. That's but, the same with me. I run a. It couldn't be any smaller, really. I and that's how I want to keep it, and because it, it it keeps the stress levels down, yes. and it yes. it means that I can go out and do things that I enjoy doing. Yeah, we we elected to downsize. I had two crews at one point, and uh, I think we were running about seven employees, and then I elected just pretty much cold turkey to downsize and reduce the amount of equipment that we had, but you know, increase the quality of that equipment. Uh, to be more productive and uh, started having more of a laser focus on making sure my employees were well educated, prop- properly equipped, and trying to get a hold of people, or if not create people, to become passionate about arboriculture and, and uh, to get a better product out yeah. of your employees. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, the more, obviously the more employees you have, the harder it is to, oh, yeah. to kind of monitor everybody and make sure everybody is like up to standard standard with like safe work practices and everybody's keeping the quality of the work high and mm. all that kind of stuff dude i'm telling you i had uh yeah all the expenditures when you're trying to you know, the economy of scale you know and for me uh i wanted to work i wanted to work somewhere that i wanted to work and i yeah. wanted to own a business that i was proud to work for honestly and I didn't really know what that meant, like what that would look like to me, because anywhere I I ever worked, if I worked for Bartlett or uh, other small tree company out of Maryland, uh, Ballard Enterprises, we were we were grinders. We worked really hard. We did not 
really let up. It was 50 hours a week, you know, and um, worked with those companies through the, uh, the economy when it got rough. That was interesting. But uh, anyway, I, I started realizing that I was running my company the same way that I was working myself when I worked for those big companies. And I thought to myself, well, what do I really want? I want time off. I don't give a shit if I get paid for it. Because, you know, time is our most valuable resource. And I was the worst boss I ever had. I never gave myself time off. And uh, I, I had a couple other hippie tree climber friends that had uh, small tree companies at the time. And, and I, would, I would watch them. And I'm like, that dude's happier than me. I want to be closer to that. I want to figure out how to get there. And, uh, and so I just started making those changes to our business and giving myself time off. And now I'm, I think we're working, I work maybe three weeks out of a month and I'm taking about a week off, um, typically unpaid time. But if I can travel somewhere and be involved with training somewhere or putting on a competition or competing, I'll, I'll do that or travel just to climb somewhere. Um, I'm just, I'm really chasing that dream and almost creating it at the same time. Awesome. <laughs> you know? So you still like a lot of the time, even when you travel, you're still keeping it within the industry, but because it's not that kind of uh, that tree work, it feels like kind of time off and it feels like relaxing time, yes. even even if you're involved and you're hanging out with other arborists and you even if you're going wreck climbing, it, it just kind of has a different feel to oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I. I'm not much into picking up a chainsaw when I'm not at work. You know, I know some guys might want to get together. Like, ah, let's go do this job together. And I'm like, I'm, I'm so over it. Once I punch that clock, so to speak, at work, I am done. I'm trying to catch a movie. I want to go get up in a tree. I want to do, I want to have, I want to live life. Yeah. Because life should not be all about work. Um, and uh, I, honestly, as a workers' rights advocate, I am. Uh, and as a human rights, uh, someone who believes strongly in human rights, you know, that's a lot of my thoughts and ideas and things that I've learned over time about, you know, workers' rights and human rights have led me to construct a place that I want to work. And that, one of those primary things is giving yourself time off to rest your body and then making sure you're working hard to maintain your mental health, which is an important component of our work because of the stress. Yeah. And I tell my wife all the time, I'm like, look, I don't, if I make less money because we're living life this way, I'm okay with that because I'm happy. What's crazy is that we're making every bit, every bit as much money, if not more, when it, than when we were working four days, uh, excuse me, five days a week and uh, five weeks a month. You know, so if I do go out of town, the uh, folks who are working for me will kind of keep things rolling. But I work hard to make sure they're taking time off and that they're resting their body when they need to because those are all things that I ended up suffering from coming up in the business. I had to get, I had back surgery last year and that was because of a cumulative effect over time of you know compression of the spine, most likely from lifting wood year after year, shoulder carrying and shit to the back of the truck. And I vowed to myself that I would not, uh, I would not continue to do tree work if I had to do things kind of the old way. I'm fine to work hard, but we need to get the most out of our lives, the most out of our bodies. So we invested in equipment to lift for us, and and because those things are just a way to empower ourselves, you know? What are you gonna do with all this knowledge that we come up with and all the things that we learn, if you never implement them, it's useless, right? Yeah. But anyway, and, I, and, I'm and, and the, bro. I'm no, the, the thing is as well, is um, this industry uh, generally has quite a high turnover of staff. So if you can make your, if you can run a business that's really enjoyable to work for, you're, you're not one of those bosses that people then ask for time off like you're actually encouraged the time off um you you provide in like the good good quality equipment um you're really invested in like safety and stuff that if 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 i could work somewhere like that that would make me stay there and so uh, and then which puts less stress on you because you don't have this turnover mm -hmm. of staff all the time and so then it becomes a more enjoyable place for you you're having time off you guys are having time off so when you're actually working, everybody's excited to oh, be yeah. at work. They're um, amped. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've been talking to people about this very idea a lot over the past couple of days. Uh, you know, big companies like Google uh, found if they went to a four-day work week that their employees were 40% more productive. Yeah. And uh, so and there's a number of other examples of that within big I think industry. like in Sweden or somewhere they do that as well. They're, they're, and, or they do like six-hour six work days or something. Yeah, it, yeah. People need to start getting that kind of stuff figured out. 
so that we can continue honestly to start advancing humanity. Yeah, so you're not you know? just burning burning people out and then on to the next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, our, our bodies are really, they're kind of meant to be used as tools. But at the same time, we have to start recognizing and then search for why we're here and enjoy our time while we're on this planet. You know, this is, this is an amazing place. And to, you know, live your whole life working, it's honorable. I mean, I, I love being a blue collar guy. I love being that guy, right? And I, I connect with that. But I also, you know, again, I just I recognize uh, the necessity that the idea that time is our most valuable resource, you know, tenfold to money. You awesome. can make more I, money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can, yeah, I completely agree with where you're coming from. And it's kind of how, especially since I started my own company, it's how I've started to live life. Because I used to run a, a tree company back in the UK before I moved out to Canada. And we had like eight employees and I was just stressed non-stop oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and so so now I've decided my tree company is going to be as small as it possibly can be I'm going to take the time where I need it do trips away where I need yeah. it and, and keep like that anyway be um, selfish be selfish yeah. for your time you have yeah. to be actively selfish um, tell me tell me about um, North American Open Masters and where the idea came from and what kind of What's the setup of Man, the competition? Great question. Uh, full disclosure, I'll be completely honest. I, I've talked about this with a number of friends over the years, but not everyone knows this. Um, I ended up winning the first Jambo, and I enjoyed the comp, loved the culture of it. And that's an important word that I use there because it's something that over time we've recognized that there is a, a tree climbing culture that exists within within comps, within tree climbing. And I, I, I love the idea of a competition being able to make that connection with the climbers about, you know, climber culture. And what I mean by that is people showing up who are, it's not so much industry focused. It's very, very much about community. And it's also about allowing people to have fun. Obviously creating boundaries uh, for safety. Um, but honestly, you know, where, the, where Naom came from was I went to Jambo, enjoyed it, had fun. Uh, did not believe everything was perfect about it, and I know people know how I feel about that. But uh, I also, you know, saw some things with the ISA comps. I love the ISA comps. Been involved with them for um, over 15 years, competing and involved with TCCs. But I thought that there were things there that, you know, culturally weren't great. You know, people would greet you with a, a weird attitude, or they'd be grumpy, or, um, you know, too heavily, uh, you know, too much about the rules and, and being really sticklers about that kind of stuff and um, I felt like there was there was some Goldilocks porridge in there somewhere in between I, I, I felt I felt like I wanted to create a competition that uh, allowed climbers to really just be themselves to be in an environment amongst other people who love to climb uh, not just industry professionals yeah if you know where I'm coming from and it's been it's taken me a long time to articulate because it's a growing thing that's evolving, evolving in my yeah. mind about how, you know, how, if I could put my finger on what Naom is, it, that competition is one that is purpose built for other people who don't love to climb trees, but are fucking wackadoodle about it, who, who love, absolutely love to climb trees and compete. And we all recognize, at least out here in the States, we recognize that, um, you know, there's that culture that exists and people wanted to start traveling. They wanted to compete outside of ISA competitions uh, for a number of reasons. You know, they wanted that shot to that opportunity to compete in the Masters. And that's something that Naom provides. If, if you have had the luxury of uh, getting into an ISA Masters challenge, it's, it's, an, it's an incredible experience. It's, power, it's been powerful for me. I think I've competed in as many as 50 Masters challenges um, in, in my time of competing. And didn't, I probably didn't win half of those, I'm sure of it, but I was just so stoked to get in. And I, I, I was like, we have to figure out a way to share this experience, to, to set this stage for competitors and climbers. Because honestly, that's another thing that Naom is about. It's a way that I feel that I can lift up our industry and, and create a stage for these competitors, these working class heroes, people who are doing incredible work, dangerous work, hazardous work uh, throughout the US and wherever. I uh, wanted them to have a, an opportunity to demonstrate their skills and their craft um, and, and really have just a blast doing it. So a couple of things that are special, we have 
Uh, we have music playing throughout the day to create that vibe. And one of the things that I recognized over the years from training for TCCs and, and wrecking, really they're one and the same, that word wrecking and training are one and the same for me because we found ourselves, we'd get up in a tree and you dangle about for a bit. And I call it dangle about. You just get up there, you hang out, shoot the shit, whatever. You have a good time taking a view. I love all that stuff. But over time, that, that climbing evolved. And I said, well, we, get, we do this dangle about, we're only up there for 20 minutes to an hour, but I really want to climb more. So we started making goal-oriented recreational climbing where, you know, just like a comp, you'd hang bells. But we took it further and, uh, you know, we created uh, training where we would have master's challenges. And so it was a very disciplined time where you'd get together with a few of your buddies, and we still do this. We train this way very often. Um, but you, you hang four or five bells, and your goal is, just like a, a master's, you want to display the skill of setting the line, ascending into the tree, moving throughout the crown, gear retrieval, within an allotted time. But it's not about, you know, we're training to get better at climbing, not necessarily to go faster. You want to complete the task, but um, it's a, just a very disciplined time of training. So that training kind of led into ideas about how we could make a competition format like that where we could take what we love to do with recreation and again, turn it into tree climbing. So, um, but anyway, long story short, one of the reasons we have Evo there below Naom obviously denotes evolution, is I think that ISA, and I'll, I'll, I'll say ISA because they've created honestly this great game. It's an incredible game. Um, you know, great structure and rules and integrity in the sport, and I love that. I have a lot of respect for um, the tree climbing competition game, you know, uh, but I felt like they never really set out to create a game that could evolve quickly enough. I mean, you've seen tree climbing explode in the past 10 years with uh, single rope technique, right? So, love you too, dude. <laughs> Mike Zettel behind the camera. So, my, my point is, yeah, Naom Evolution is about everything that we can do to take the game to the next level. Where I think uh, at least tree climbing in the US wants to see uh, tree climbing move to, or, uh, move to in the next decade. And I think that uh, everything from transparency with our finances to making sure the athletes or competitors who are showing up are trained and ready and vetted, their skills are vetted, making sure um, the volunteers and judges and techs I'm not assuming, hey, that guy's been in the industry for 20 years, throw him in the ring and put a, a score sheet behind his hand. We're training those people too. And not just Naom, because I, I don't know if you've heard about this, but we have prerequisites for our competitors. We have prerequisites uh, for the volunteers. And, and I think initially people were, thought that would be a tall order, like no one would abide by the standard. They'd be like, well, how the hell are you gonna get volunteers if you tell them that they can't run a score sheet if they don't do a dry run? How's that, how's that gonna go down? I was horrified. Um, I was honestly horrified to take that on because I, I didn't, I wanted to put people in a position, yes, where they literally have to demonstrate their skill. You know what I mean? And I, 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 when I first brought these ideas out years ago, people called me salty. You know, and they said shit to me that honestly was offensive, but I, I had a lot of foresight about where I thought, how the game could improve. And you have to increase the quality of your judging. If you're gonna have a, an event that is, um, that has discretion, right? And not just a timed event, you've gotta teach those people how to judge. Yeah, you gotta understand tree climbing and every yes. every aspect of it to, to give those discretionary points. Yeah. And someone's gonna probably get all upset for hearing me say this, but a lot of the cats who are in those rings, ISA events, and, and it's not all their fault, they need the training. And when you put on an ISA event, you've got to get help. So it's, some, it's like sometimes you yeah. got to get a warm body and put them in there behind a score sheet. And I get that. Yeah. And do, do you know what the thing is, like, judging an event, I've never, I've never done, I've never been a judge, but I've looked at a score sheet while a climb has been going on, and I've been asked to be a judge a couple of times. Um, but I, I compete quite a lot, but it, I, it actually scares me to, when I look at the score sheet and watch somebody climb, I'm like, oh God, how, how would I score that? Like, yeah. where do I, 
give them the points was the other person better because I, I watch I can watch two people and, and kind of feel like in my eyes so and so was better than the other person but if I were to score and especially do it all day long like it yeah. kind of scares me how I could be consistent and like and so it's not like, it's not an easy task to it do it's not and it's laborious it really is and it's part of the reason uh, another thing that we're doing with Naomi all those prizes excuse me I had coffee breath and it burped um, all the prizes that we get from our sponsors those are given to the volunteers because the competitors that between the stage that we set all the production value involved with Naomi at this point which by the way is almost 100% monetarily supported by the tree climbing community, not by sponsors. Wow. Wow. And I, I think that's something that makes it special, um, you know, because it has done so well. It has been, um, it's, you know, not just hype, but hype, the hype is real. Uh, and I think people have, you know, if you go there and you've been to the event, you see it, you, under, you understand why. But we've gone further uh, in just a couple of years than I think entities that are bigger than us. For example, with our... Uh, we're, lo- we're putting people up in lodging. I had over 40 volunteers put up an, in Airbnbs out there in Savannah, Georgia, uh, because it's just like, what else can I do to better serve these volunteers? I'm, I'm going to push them. I'm going to make them almost have to learn things that weekend. But, Dan, what we're trying to figure out is how do we get people, our volunteers, to be really be inspired to want to learn, And right? excited about coming. And, yeah. yeah, and if, if you can make their trip easy and comfortable and then they don't have to worry about all the logistics. Yeah. It, yeah. it does work out that I think people at this point have figured out that Naomi is a climber's comp and it's one where people, again, they're they're ex- really excited about climbing. They think about it all the time like I do. It's it's the thing we geek, at, geek out about. So a lot of the folks that are showing up, they're game, they're ready, they want to do a dry run. Uh, they want to be able to demonstrate their skills and have their skills tested even uh, at the risk of you know, having their peers around, but we treat that time, I don't want to call it sacred, but we have reverence for that time. I, I instruct people who are involved with the dry runs to make sure you're not grab bassing too much. You know, make, if you're going to say something to someone, it's got to be constructive and, and encouraging. Um, but, you know, it's not just about chasing the bells, it's about how you do it. And so everything from our score sheets reflect that. We have our own scoring format. Um, and uh, where we're, we're tr- working hard to have the judges watching the climb and not the score sheet. So we have a very kind of a more broken down score sheet and um, one that, in my opinion, is easier to understand and read and follow along with uh, throughout the climb. But uh, outside of that, also, if you, people have probably seen pictures and videos, we have our nighttime open ascent, which I'm really proud of. Uh, myself and Brian Brock years ago came up with that idea after just doing parties at our farm and in Maryland, where we'd get together, we'd have a party, we'd, I'd put my slack line out, we'd get out there, you know, drinking a couple beers and slack lining, and I'd hang a light. And we, they were stupid lights, you know, then I'd have black lights and stuff. Um, and we would just do that to fuck around and, and hang out and climb at night, you know. And that evolved to doing an event at Tree Jam Camp uh, a couple months later. And, uh, and, and then obviously, if you've seen pictures or video of the nighttime open ascent it's very special it, i think it's cool enough that a number of uh, other entities took the idea and uh, initially i was upset about that but the truth is man i honestly i'm honored I, yeah I think, the truth is it's an awesome idea and like you should be flattered that other people have yeah, done that yeah um, if, well, if especially if they saw it from from your competition and took it on and thought that's amazing. Like, yeah, that's that's, I dig that's it. just flattering. I, I love the idea of uh, of my ideas being used on a broader stage. What did bother me initially was this, Dan, and I'll articulate this the best way I know how. And it, I looked at if I if I as a tree climber and someone who has as active as I am within the tree climbing community and within just climbing trees, right? I thought to myself, if anybody should stand to benefit from my ideas, it should be me or my community. But when you have a multi-billion dollar company taking your ideas because they saw your shit online or whatever, it bothered me. It bothered me to my core because I felt taken from. And I'm like, fuck it. If you're going to take my idea, that's fine. But I wish you, somebody would take my idea for the, the, uh, uh, the way we do AR, AR with the blind. I want ISA to take that idea. I think that'd be great for them to pick that up because 
That way people can't hawk the climb. Once you're done the climb, if you're a competitor, you can go watch, you know, and there's been some people that felt like they weren't real happy with how that event uh, was in that um, you couldn't watch the other people climb, but you, you absolutely can after you yeah. have so that's what So that's what you mean about the event, um, about everybody who's not competed in that event can't watch anybody else until they've had their turn and then they can watch everybody else yes. after that. Yes, yeah. and then we did get plenty of encouragement from uh, a number of competitors who would go back and watch. Um, you know, it's just human nature, but so, you know, you get more people kind of stack up and watch a more high profile climber, so to speak, if I can say it that way. Uh, you know, if a James Earhart or uh, Bull Hammerstrand went in there to do AR, you, you know, all, all eyes were on what's going on there. But we, that was actually, I made that a quiet zone because in years past, I had a lot of chattiness happening at that sequestered AR and people would talk, they'd get there, they'd hang out and watch, but then they'd talk. And I was like, this is taking away from what I'm trying to create a very organic experience. And that's what's incredible, Dan, about the sequestered AR is you get an organic experience that is not just about competition. You're literally putting yourself in as almost as, you know, the best, you know, opportunity to create that scenario almost like it's real. Yeah. And people have come to me all the time when they're like, there's no other way this thing should be done because you go in there and you just you learn everything in the moment. You know, you don't know anything beforehand. It's it creates a very a genuine experience. Yeah, it's a it's it's the best way to yeah to create a real as mu as close to a real life uh, scenario as possible. Like it was that's how um, how Dave ran it at the aerial rescue challenge. Yeah. And it's the first time I've, I'd ever done an aerial rescue where uh, I'd been sequestered. Oh well, I'd done a couple before where I'd been the first person to go, so I hadn't seen anybody, but. That's the first time where I'd been at a competition where you were sequestered, and it was crazy because even even like at the ISA comps where I'd done the rescue first, I'd still seen the the scenario. I'd still possibly seen a run through of somebody do it first. Um, whereas when you when you haven't seen the tree, you haven't seen the casualty, you haven't seen the situation. It's it's crazy because it, like you, you can't you, yeah you can't prepare anything like you can in an ISA yeah so you can't have all this gear preset because it, you might get in there and none of it's any it is, use it and is you have so to, much yeah. more of a, a true test of your skill yeah how do you perform under under duress yeah. how do you perform when when you didn't you don't you weren't fully prepared mentally or your gear or whatever yeah and and that's definitely what we were after Benito I love you um but uh, yeah, so the sequestered AR, great idea. I think it's, you know, the nighttime open ascent is so much fun, um, but that, that sequestered AR is really the gem of the event. Yeah. Um, we've got a lot of great people. Dave Stice has been helping with that over the past couple of years. Um, a, a number of uh, professionals, uh, Steve is out there helping with that too. Um, in, in any case, uh, Richard Mumford and, and, and uh, Marty, Robinson, a great entry tech from the U.S. here, and uh, just a, a lot of really just stellar people that help make that event incredible. Uh, we have recently adopted some ideas from uh, ARC, which which I actually made an adjustment to our score sheets, uh, and and which the climbers all have access to. But uh, on there for the ABCs, the air, uh, uh, airway breathing and circulation, which are really a, a part of a, the score sheet that um, the ISA events are missing. And, and that's, I hate to keep bringing ISA into this, but Dave said it, I listened to his podcast as well with you, which was great. Um, you know, we discussed it, the idea that the, uh, sorry, some background noise, the, uh, one of the issues that we've had with the ISA aerial rescue is you, you don't actually have five minutes to do, do the event. You do it in five minutes, you're timed out. You, you need to do it in four minutes and 59 seconds. So, you know, in any case, on top of that, they merit speed. You know, they give points, they work points for speed. And the truth is, if you did a, a, an actual live rescue in 30 minutes, that would be a world record, right? So it, that what we used to think was a good training tool for aerial rescue, you know, you're more likely to become a second victim if you're getting somebody down in three and a half minutes. But, uh, but obviously their excuse over the years has been, well, you don't understand, Coates, we've got X amount of people to run through the event, so we've got to 
you know, time's got to be a thing, and I get that. I do. Yeah. But we have been able to demonstrate that we can get 40 people through it in a day with a 10 or 12 minute AR. So we have been able to demonstrate that you can lengthen that time to give the climbers an appropriate amount, hey, uh, appropriate amount of time for the climb and to build a plan for the climb. And um, in any case, I'm very easily distractible. <laughs> buddies all around. We'll be talking to him. That's my buddy, Josh. Okay. But, um, Okay, what else? This, uh, you know, so I, I really love a lot of the things that we're doing with Naom, Dan, and uh, I want to get you to come out to that comp. I would love to come out to you that know, comp. You, dude, you absolutely I just missed a, it. You have an yeah. invite. You absolutely yeah. have an invite. I'm going to be working hard to put together the next one in California on the West Coast. Awesome. We, we've done, we're really trying to create a circuit. This year I did two comps. I don't know if I'll do that again. <laughs> It's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. A lot of, well, and so do you do it near where you live, or have you done well, one We had one elsewhere? at the National Arboretum in D.C., which is a half an hour from my place. Uh, that worked out. It was convenient. I do have a good relationship with the Arboretum, which helps. Uh, but I'm really trying to uh, create a network around the U.S., really in other parts of North America as well. We do have plans to start to travel north into Canada and, and uh down in New Mexico as well. We do have some folks that have said some things to us, like, hey, we'd like to do a comp here. And I would love to grow it outside of the U.S. Um, not just, uh, and I'm, I am just thinking right now about North America, but I'm not thinking about going global with this comp or nothing. But if somebody did approach me, like maybe some other sugary beverage, if they, <laughs> you know, if Monster comes to me and they're like, hey, Coates, you know, you, you got a good comp. Uh, we want to help you. And I'd be like, I'll take their money, Dan, but... Uh, as far as the way the comp's going to be run, it's going to be governed to you. By, by me and the climbers who put the thing on. We want, the, we want climbing and competitions to be driven by uh, the climbing community. That's very strongly how a lot of us feel. And uh, we, it's, it's, you know, it's just a, you know, these events for me have had a lot of teeth because uh, we have a lot of tree workers dying here in the U.S., you know, and from, obviously it's hazard, hazardous work, so these competitions can be an incredibly powerful tool uh, to help educate people, get people inspired about ar arboriculture, and just keep people connected as a community. So I, I think there's, there's honestly, um, the trade shows do a good job getting people together too, and, but I, I personally think bang for your buck, uh, TCCs do it, do it the best, you know? And uh, so that's part of the reason I continue to be involved with them is, is you know, the power for good that they can have, and I think that um, any events that we're involved with, and I say we, is because we're, there's a growing team that's involved with what we're doing with Naom and Legends in Florida, uh, which has become an incredible training ground for TCCs, uh, in which we do have, we abide by an ISA format there, um, but I'm, we're training up 50, 60 climbers for three days during that week, you know, getting them uh, up to speed on their skills, indoctrinating them with the th thought processes of setup and uh, with moving through a tree and uh, lanyard usage and, you know, not only are we training people to be better competitors, but also um, better tree workers, safer tree workers. But I presume because you're trying to create these, like, real-life rescue scenarios, part of your competition, it's actually quite exciting from competition to competition to see what ideas you can come up with for oh, the yeah. next one because you try and make them quite... Uh, outlandish. Yes, yeah, so uh, uh, recently we, uh, out in D.C., we had a scenario that initially didn't seem very pertinent, it didn't seem like it made sense, right? But then even since, I've seen articles pop up about it. But we had, uh, my buddy Brennan Phillips came up with this idea where we would rescue a casualty from a tree on a parachute. And at first I was like, ah, you know, what's great about it is it, it catches your attention. And, you know, it's this kind of wild looking scenario. But and I love that, that there's almost like this production value to the, the rescue. But I thought initially, I was like, well, how often does that happen? Holy hell, it happens way more often than any other kind of aerial rescue that happens in America because you have all these bases throughout the U.S. and they do this parachute training. And they're often, they'll often call in uh, uh, arborists to do rescues uh, from trees and help these guys get down. So I was like, this is, this is pertinent. This makes sense, dude. Let's let's do this. You know, after a little bit of research, we found that people were getting stuck in parachutes and trees and needed, and fire engines would show up to get them down or whatever. One, one actually happened fairly close to where I live uh, last year, I think. 
Yeah. Um, and they had to get in search and rescue team to come and get them out. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, they got stuck in a big cottonwood. Uh, Did you yeah. see the article? Uh, it was out there Pacific Northwest about three months ago. A, a little yellow plane got stuck in the top of a spruce about 200 feet. No. <laughs> they sent an arborist no. up there to go get the people out. I got to find that article again, but I, you know, started looking at that, Dave. I, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to ruin any ideas. But <laughs> we did briefly discuss the idea of a plane in a tree, yeah. and it, obviously, lots got to come <laughs> to fruition. And I didn't spoil the surprise because. It, We'll make sure we got a blind on that one, but uh, that we could do that. You know, stuff that is not, I don't want to say not accomplishable with ISA events. We have this freedom to build what we want with, these, with this competition, yeah. you know, with, with ARC and with NAO. We yeah. can do whatever we want, you know. And that, that, that is the beauty of your competition. You're, you're the driving force and you kind of steer it in the direction you want it to go, whereas... The, the issue that with the ISA comps and the problem that they have is that it's it's a format that has to be implemented for like worldwide mm -hmm. that everybody can follow that same structure so they can't that's like you were saying they can't really ev evolve oh well they can it evolve it but it's difficult. very slow because yeah. they have to have so many people to go through to to vet the rules oh, yeah. and to and, to, and they, like it's the whole committee and, that, and simultaneously there's like every chapter has to grow up to those standards like people ought to realize there's there's almost a new chapter popping into the isa events every year you know especially asian countries growing yeah. and now we're isa's got uh more chapters that are popping up in uh south america and i love it i think that's great i, I want to be i would love to help with some of that and help grow tree climbing throughout the world that way with tccs because it can be a great way to connect with people, yeah. you know. And I, I've been out to Hong Kong twice now and, and out to Taiwan just uh, this year with my buddy Josh. And those were all connections that I made through TCCs and knowing wow. people who competed, you know. And that, I know that's the tip of the iceberg for me. It's, we're scratching the surface of what we can do in tree climbing and, and how we can grow the sport and, and how we can grow recreational tree climbing. I think we're really at the forefront of it, you know. But... Um, I think this, the lifestyle that we're trying to create, it didn't exist, but we're creating it, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and it's wild to, to see what's happening, see that being built and being a part of it is, is really cool and rewarding. Cause I, if you're like I am, if you did it a bit of rock climbing when, when you were younger, and I, I did, I wasn't very good at it, way better at tree climbing. Um, my body type is strange. Ever, the fact that I ever had any success in tree climbing is kind of weird because I'm shaped like a potato. <laughs> but um, I felt like, uh, oh my gosh, where was that idea at? <laughs> the, uh, yeah, yeah, so wh where tree climbing is going right now, at least for me, uh, I love the idea of traveling. I know you do too. And uh, the opportunity, if, you, if you're like, hey, I, I've, I know uh, a couple buddies down there in Mexico, and, and uh, I, I'm, even if you're just friends online, yeah. and you see a TCC pop up, you can hit that guy up and be like, hey, you, you need some help putting your comp together, or do you guys want some extra competitors? You know, like that, that mixing of people and the cross-pollinization of all that helps make the comps better. And, yeah. Oh my gosh, we need more of that in the US. Uh, I will tell you right now, I don't know how it works in the UK or in Europe or other countries of the world, but uh, the U.S. has struggled over the years with ISA comps uh, in integrating uh, people from outside chapters. You know, I know my chapter, the Mid-Atlantic chapter, has very few people that come from outside of our chapter to either help volunteer or to compete. And it's been frustrating for a lot of us. We've had discussions behind the scenes, um, but that's been a weird and sensitive issue for people. They don't feel comfortable discussing that. And I'm like, why? And, Let's, let's, you know, get some, some fresh people in here, some new blood. And it's always difficult for people to figure out how to integrate that because ISA has built this format where it's like, you're from here, you're from here. You don't go and compete yeah. here. The guy who wins this, he goes here. Like, I want to, honestly, my vision of a utopian idea of a tree climbing competition, it doesn't matter where you're from. You know, Just almost op chap open arms kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I, I think that's why some of this has happened. The Red Bull comp, doesn't matter where yeah. you're from. Yeah. The Jam Jambo, doesn't matter where you're from. Yeah. Naom, Legends, all of the, of the independent comps, in my, in my opinion, are going to rule the roost in the future because they do so many damn things right. 
Like, yeah. ISA is doing great. They've built a great game, but there's been an evolution of tree climbing and, and competitions, and people, they crave more. They want more, you know. Um, and I think those events, you know, part of the reason they're doing a bit better uh, in terms of popularity lately, I've got a, I've got a pretty good finger on what's happening. Yeah. Um, those events are becoming more popular because uh, they, they kind of, they get at more of what people are wanting. They're a little less industry based and, and more about connecting people, I think, and, and um, have more of that climber culture that we want. Yeah. You know? Anyway, Dan, yeah, I, I, yeah, I love, I love the fact that there's, there's all these new types of competition kind of popping up everywhere. And like yours, the more, the more competitions, the better, because each, each individual competition will have its own kind of set of rules. It will have its the own specific events that that person who kind of starts a competition for whatever reason that's how they feel a competition would best run for them or they maybe if they were to comp compete in it that's what they would want from a competition and like so I just have I've had the experience from going to do the the Red Bull competition mm -hmm. and Man, I've never had so much fun at a competition in, in all the competitions I've been to. It was like everything. It was the, um, the just the amount of competitors that they had there just made it amazing. So the amount of spectators mm. watching everybody else and cheering. Uh, the, like, like yours, they had music all day long playing. Um, most people got to climb multiple times. I like that. Um, yes, more entry time. Yeah. That's one of the, and think about when you show up to, oh, I'm going to say it again. You show up to an ISA event, and you look at internationals, man. The internationals is a three-day event, Yeah. right? And the average for a, a, a competitive climber within the I, ISA internationals, you're going to spend eight or nine minutes. Do the do the math, right? you got a three-and-a-half-minute work climb, three-and-a-half-minute yeah. uh, AR. That's your entry time. And then you've got an, an ascent event, which is seconds. Yeah. So you're talking about eight or nine minutes of climbing for fucking three days. Get out of Dodge. Like, that's that's, wh that's why, <laughs> like, um, so whenever I've made the Masters in an ISA, I'm so happy because I get, I get to climb for like 25 minutes. And it's like, you get to kind of set the stage from having nothing in the tree and you get to do the whole, you know, mm -hmm. install your lines, climb around. And that pretty much makes me so happy to reach the masters because I'm like, yes, I get yes, to do this whole climbing. extra yeah, climb. That's, yeah. the, that's the gift, man. That's what we started realizing. And, you know, uh, you'd go out to a chapter comp, you know, outside of your chapter and, um, you know, you, you do really well in the prelims, maybe get first or second in the prelims. And if you're lucky, that chapter might give you a shot to compete in their masters, you know. And for me, I worked my ass off to figure out how to beat James Earhart in my chapter in Mid-Atlantic. So, and, and I went, you know, 11 straight years in the Masters, and I, I couldn't get past him, you know, and he's just, him among others, there's a, 10 incredible tree climbers in our chapter, uh, or more, you know, Jeff Inman's in there, and it's like, you gotta work your ass off to it, that's a strong chapter, now we have Josh Burr, but in any case, so, if I went to the, let's say, Tennessee uh, tree climbing comp, no, that's not a good example, they're, they're a state, they're a state comp, um, but great, great, uh, great comp actually. Uh, but the uh, if you went to the Southern chapter and you got it, you know, first or second in the prelims, you know, they might invite you in to compete. But it was just, you know, I don't. I bring that chapter up as an example. But there's been chapters that I've been to where I might have bested the prelims, right? And all I ever wanted was a shot to run the Masters. I don't give a shit about the prizes. And I know so many climbers in the U.S. and throughout the world felt this, feel the same way. But these chapters, they're groups of people. They just, you know, maybe never had that conversation. They didn't know how to articulate why they would tell you no or they wouldn't understand, like, the pain that you would feel because you didn't get a chance to climb. <laughs> Again, you know, even though you might have earned your way. And I look at it like this. We've been discussing this more openly now, so I feel comfortable talking about it. But um, a lot of those climbers that are traveling, they want that shot. They want that shot to run the Masters. It Obviously, they can't go represent the chapter. Uh, but they just—it's like if you showed up to El Cap, right? And you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Dan, you're uh, you're not from here, so you get to, you don't get to climb this. And you're like, whoa, I came all the way here. I wanted a shot to climb El Cap. That's a lot of money you expended. It's time. It's you. You. We are doing that shit because we love to climb. 
I don't, we don't care about no booty. We want to measure our skills against our peers, against our friends, and we want an opportunity to demonstrate our skill. I don't, I never looked at it any other way. If that's selfish, then so be it. That's, that's what we want. That's what a lot of climbers have wanted. And that's why another reason that I think some of these comps like uh, Naomi having an open masters, having a shot to really run a masters that way has got people excited because they don't have those barriers to entry. Yeah. And, and uh, an oppor- you know, gives you opportunity. And I suppose that's why for a competition like yours, you, you probably get so many people, not just from the area where you're holding it, but from all over, especially all over North America. Yeah. Whereas in the chapter comp, you very where you might get like might one, two maybe two people yeah. from out of chapter come in and um, yeah, so it's it kind of opens the doors for everybody to attend and then so if you're a person that only has ever really competed in your chapter, mm-hmm. you just you know the guys that are going to be there yeah. and like in each competition you might you might get like 15, 10, 15 people that you haven't seen before if it moves around it within your chapter but you know the people who are definitely going to be there and then you see the way they climb and you kind of know oh yeah you, if you got a good gauge of things you yeah have, you kind yeah. of know what's what's going to happen and who's going to do what whereas if you can go to a competition where there's 40, 50 climbers that you maybe only know one or two of them you've never seen any of them climb you, you kind of learn so much more you make kind of way more friends and um, and you just kind of expand that network oh, of yeah. arborists yeah. Um, and it's like as soon as you go to a competition with people you've never met before just because you're at the competition it feels like you've already got this kind of connection mm-hmm. and it's you know it's easy to it's not like you're talking to a stranger in the street you already feel like you know the person because they're at the same event that you're at and mm-hmm. you've, you've got like common ground oh yeah yeah, and we're we're lucky, man. We're fortunate to be in an industry that uh, there is that sense of community. You know, uh, you look at uh, I don't know uh, people who are you know washing windows for a living. I don't know if they get together and have conventions for that, but maybe they do. But you know, the the idea and that, that there's this sense of community, and I'll call it family. It's really family for me at this point because. Um, I grew up, I didn't, I didn't have much in the way of family. I you know, got kicked out when I was 14, so uh, I don't stay real well connected with uh, my blood relatives. And over time, um, the tree community became my family. So that's, that's definitely where I am. And uh, that's why I take things as seriously as I do uh, with the TCCs, because that's, that's your family. You tell your family you're going to do something, you, you fucking do it, you know, yeah. or you make a promise to somebody and... and uh, anyway, but yeah, we do. We have that commonality, and, and you know what I want to do, Dan? I want to grow that family somehow in the next couple of years. We got to start figuring out. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk and discussion about how we can grow TCCs in the U.S. and how we can popularize tree climbing and recre- recreational climbing. And everyone's got ideas, uh, and for so long, it's been like say stuff or uh, educate the uh, uh, the broader world. You know, uh, and and talk to uh, Sally Sue, and you got you got to educate the public about this stuff. And I don't think that's the case. I I personally believe if you're going to grow this sport and you're going to grow tree climbing, you have to find the existing people that are within this industry and make them fans of the sport. All right. So, and that's one of the things that I've been focused on over the past few years is if I get somebody to come to Legends or Naom, and I'm going to train them up. I'm kind of talking to them about the ideas of, of all these things, about tree climbing and uh, you know how you can figure out how to climb and have fun after work, and really getting people to kind of drink the Kool Aid of what is tree climbing. Yeah. You know, and and I think once people get that bug, and you can make all of these new cats that are coming in, if you can make them fans of the sport, we can dro- we can we can grow the sport uh, exponentially faster. And I I find that like the way you talked about that. Um, that's kind of what gave me the passion back for, for being an arborist because I after about six, seven years of, of working in the industry, I was kind of sick of it. I was done. But yeah. at that point, I'd never been part of a tree climbing competition, uh, never never taken part, never volunteered, no, nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and as soon as I started with the competitions, I kind of got this spark back for being an arborist. And ever since then, I've absolutely loved my job. Um, and I don't... 
I don't see that going away because everything that's happened since then is kind of built on top yes, of that. And yes. like, I, I just really enjoy having the community of friends around me that are arborists and it makes such a difference from looking to when I was like four years in the industry working for a company and the guys I worked with were just there for a job. They didn't care yeah. about yeah. trees. They, they were just there to get a paycheck kind of thing. Um, and I think having all these different types of competitions and meeting the people that go and hang out with each other and, you know, everybody's camping together and everybody's just... Like, passionate about what they do. Yeah. 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 I mean, how do you make yourself better? You surround yourself with other people who are either better than you or absolutely have the same passion that you do. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't wake up this way every day, Dan, but I really do try to keep it in my mind like when I wake up, get up, you fat bastard, go attack the day. Be the best that you can and go, you know, go carve yourself uh, a place in the world. Yeah. Go make something of yourself. Go do something good. You know, and I think that we need to, you can recognize those people, your peers, and you're like, I, I probably don't want to be friends with that cat because, you know, he, he's fucking up, he's disinterested, he doesn't, he lacks passion. Obviously, we always work hard to bring those people in. But yeah, it's, we want to connect with people that, um, that have that same drive that we do and the same desire to, to succeed. And yeah, and that's how we're going to end up enjoy, well, enjoying life. If you enjoy the work that you do, then... Like, it doesn't matter if you're making millions or not. That's right. It? Like, That's right. I, yeah. And that especially applies with an arboriculture because yeah. you can. Sure. I mean, every day you think you went out and made money, and you never. It's hard for us to realize how much we spent doing it. You know. Um, yeah, but I'd rather be broke and happy than yeah. than. Yeah. And there's all kinds of data on that too, man. They say it. After seventy-five thousand a year, you're no happier. You know. So, if you're hearing this podcast, if you're Killing yourself for a hundred thousand dollars a year, brain uh, in a little bit. You're not going to be any happier <laughs> than it, you know if you made less. But uh, anyway, so. But yeah, I really appreciate you doing this, Chris, and giving up some time to uh, Dan no to problem, sit down and dude. have a bit of a and, chat with me, and, and maybe maybe uh, in a few months' time we we do a, another one so we can really really get into more about your, your competitions okay. and, and different ideas and where they might be popping up I've around the place. I've got some great ideas. I, and Yeah. Uh, I, if some of the stuff that I disclosed to you this evening you might have not known about. No. Uh, but I've got so much more to share with people that, that uh, has happened the past few weeks and, and really a couple days uh, pertaining to, to the TCCs that we're involved with. Um, but I, I'd love to get together with, with you again and, and discuss Legends uh, maybe right after it happens, if that works. Can yeah, Maybe definitely. give you a rundown. Uh, I really want, uh, this year I want to get ISA involved with what we're doing. I want them to see what we've done with that competition and how it's become a training ground uh, training ground for uh, the young people, younger people, if I may say. If you're, if you're 39 and younger, you come to help and you put the comp on and you run the score sheets. And if you're 40 and, old, and older, you compete. And that, that competition... Uh, unlike any other, in my opinion, in the world, is all about service. Naom is definitely about service, but Legends is a competition uh, about service just in, in like none other. Um, because you're, you're really sacrificing, you're putting in a lot of time, people are showing up on Tuesday to start to put together that event. Uh, it, you know, it being so grassroots and the fact that people are now taking off a week or more to go out there to be a part of it, I think sh uh, shows that uh, it's what people want to do. Yeah. Um, so I want to discuss with you about that thing for sure. Cause Definitely. I want, I want to share those ideas, and uh, I'm hoping that people will learn from what we're doing and, and maybe uh, either try to replicate it or they can, they can tell the world about what they're doing. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. P telling people about the ideas will help some people kind of spring into action and be like, oh, we can do that. Yeah. Um, or they're... They're going to hear about it and be like, right, I'm going to that next year. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. So, wicked. Dan, thank Thanks you for your time, much, bro. Yeah. Sorry I chatted your head off. I had full disclosure, I had too much coffee. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's what it's all about. I'm here not to say a lot and to the people want to hear what you've got to say. So, Dan, thank that's you. awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great to meet you, Chris. Thanks very much to Chris Coates for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate you giving up your time at the TCI Expo. Um, fantastic conversation such a nice guy that was the first time I'd met Chris and 
I also I already felt a super connection like we we'd known each other for a long long time so uh, thanks very much and I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast this podcast was also brought to you by Jobber Business Software Jobber is a business software that helps me run my own business and it's been fantastic since, since I implemented it. Uh, it makes everything more streamlined. It makes me more organized as a person. It makes me not forget to invoice jobs like I used to do. Um, so uh, I can really get behind Jobber as a product. It's been absolutely fantastic for me and it will continue to be a really great service. Um, so uh, the listeners of this podcast, Jobber are offering a 14-day free trial and then if you if you like it and you want to sign up after the free trial, you can get 20% off your first six months subscription. So that's a 14-day free trial and then 20% off your first six months subscription if you really enjoy it and you, you want to sign up. Uh, just go to the uh, go to .com and you'll see a Jobber uh, uh, image across the top banner. Just click on that and that will take you through to the link to get you that, that offer.